Hello everyone, my name is Adrian Marshall. I'm a postdoc at the Washington State Tree Fruit Research Extension Center. And today I'd like to talk to you about some of the research that Dr. Beers and I have done on netting for the control of codling moth. Netting for apple management is not a new concept. Some of the first use of netting was actually to protect apples from hail damage as seen here in the upper right. Areas in Italy and France get frequent hail events and growers could lose their entire crops if they weren't protected. While we don't have as many hail events, we do have another environmental disorder, which is that we get too much sunlight here in Washington state. And like me, when fruit is overexposed to sunlight, it gets a little sunburned. And so growers here have adapted netting for shade to help reduce heat stress to the trees and the sunburn damage. Currently, sunburn is one of the leading causes of cold apples in Washington state. It occurs when the fruit skin reaches a temperature of 115 degrees Fahrenheit, which in an orchard canopy can happen at an ambient air temperature of just 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And we frequently get that in Eastern Washington. To counteract sunburn, orchardists have a few options, which include evaporative cooling through a water mist in the orchard, kaolin clay sprays, which serve as a sunscreen on the fruit, and shade netting. There are three basic structures for netting over orchards. In the upper left, we have the top cover only, which was one of the original designs. It uses a combination of trellis poles and wires to support the netting just above the canopy, and this provides protection from sunburn and hail damage. In Europe, they adapted the netting to have a tree wrap or row cover, which looks like this on the right, and this uses the canopy of the tree to support the netting. They've shown that it provides additional protection from insects like codling moth and birds, but it must be removed to do any pruning, fruit thinning, or at harvest. Here on the bottom left, we have the full block enclosure, which is more commonly found in Washington state. It uses the trellis poles and wires again, but to support the netting above and outside of the orchard to allow machines and crews to access it so it doesn't need to be removed during harvest. The use of these drive-in net enclosures is rapidly expanding across eastern Washington. Already established blocks can be retrofitted to incorporate the netting, but it is easier and more cost efficient when the net enclosure structure is integrated with trellising systems at planting. These full block enclosures have been shown to have many benefits. They reduce heat stress not only to the fruit but to the trees. They can improve fruit size and skin color. People working under the netting have also commented how it reduced their heat stress and exposure to UV throughout the day. It allows equipment to access it for both chemical management and pruning or any orchard maintenance. It's been shown to exclude birds and deer. But what we wanna know is, can it exclude insects? So to determine the effects of these full block enclosures on apple insect management, we used a WSU research orchard to test three different treatments. One was a shade net cage covering conventionally managed trees compared to treatment two, which was just conventionally managed trees with no cage. And then treatment three is a control of no treatment at all. We did this at two scales, the small trial, which was a three tree plot and a large trial was a four and eight tree plot. In the small cage, we had 10 replicates of each treatment. And in the large trial, we had four replicates of each treatment. This experiment was done over two field seasons during 2016 and 2017. The blocks that we chose already had a large resident population of codling moth. So to determine the effects of the treatments, we used pheromone traps in each plot to monitor codling moth abundance throughout the season. We also want to take a more holistic approach to see what effects our treatments had on other indirect pests and their natural enemies. So for this, we chose to look at the woolly apple aphid and its suite of natural enemies, including its parasitoid, Aphelinus molly, and then predators, lacewings, surfids, and earwigs. To determine the effects of these treatments on the woolly apple aphid abundance and its natural enemies, we used a variety of sampling techniques. For earwigs, we used a cardboard band around the trunk of the tree. For the parasitoid, we used a yellow sticky card and then for the predators, which were lace wings and surfids, we used a white sticky card with a plant volatile lure to bring them in. And for woolly apple aphids, we just conducted time counts on the trees themselves, and this was done every two weeks. So what did we find? Well, here I'm going to show you the results from this trial in just the large cage experiment. And that's because they're almost identical to the small cage experiment. 
On these graphs, on the y-axis, we will have the average cumulative insect counts. And on the x-axis, we'll have our three treatments, which were cage, conventional, and control. The left or red bar will be the results from 2016, and then the black or right bar are the results from 2017. So here in this upper left graph, we have the results for the parasitoid Aphelinus molly. As you can see in the cage, there were significantly more parasitoids captured than either the conventional or the control, so the netting is not having a negative effect on them. In the lower right graph, we have the results for the earwigs. In 2016, we had lower counts for both the cage and conventional treatments, but in 2017, they kind of went up in all treatments and there was no significant difference, showing that the netting is not really affecting earwigs either. However, for the generalist predators, lacewings and surfids, there was a different effect going on. For both years within the cage treatment, there were significantly less compared to the conventional and the control. And this shows that the netting is having an effect and excluding them from the plot. And when you lose two groups of generalist predators, there's usually an effect on the indirect pest, which in this case was a large outbreak of woolly apple aphids. Here I included both these small and large trial graphs just to show how similar the results were when you took out these predators. And the left, left graph is the small cage and the right is the large cage. And as you can see for both 2016 and 2017, there were significantly more aphids in the cage plots than the conventional or the control. Despite the effect on natural enemies and the secondary pest, the netting did have quite an impact on cobbling moth. Here again are the small and large cage trials. In the left graph, we can see the cobbling moth capture accumulated for both years, and in the cages there was hardly any capture and significantly less than the control, whereas in the large cage there was a little more capture, but still significantly less than the conventional or the control, showing that the netting is having an additional benefit of reducing cobbling moth adult abundance within the netting. And when you reduce abundance, you also reduce the amount of damage. So here are the same graphs, but depicting percent cobbling moth damage right at harvest. So here in the left graph, we have the small cage, three treatments, and the right graph is the large cage with the three treatments. And they almost mirror each other by both showing that the netting significantly reduced cobbling moth damage, even more than conventional pesticide applications alone. So those two experiments showed that full net enclosures can reduce cobbling moth abundance and damage. But we didn't get cobbling moth down to zero, even with the addition of chemical applications. So what we wanted to know is were the calling moth that we were catching in those experiments from an outside population moving through the netting, or was it from a population that already existed within the caged area and was just perpetuating? So to determine this, we tested two treatments. One, a cage, which we used the small cages that cover three trees, versus a control of no cage. And we had five replicates in 2018 and four replicates in 2019. The goal of this experiment was to determine if cobbling moth could move through the netting and was it direction dependent. So could cobbling moth move from outside of a netted plot to inside a netted plot through immigration or inside the netted plot to outside the plot through emigration? This experimental orchard already had a high abundance of wild cobbling moth. So if we caught one, we couldn't tell if it came from inside or outside the plot. To solve this, we used sterile cobbling moth, which come with a red dye that they're fed on and helps you to identify them when you squish them. We also incorporated the use of fluorescent powders that you could see under UV light. And this was to distinguish between which treatment we released it in and if it was released for inside or outside the plot. So from this experiment, what did we find? Well, here's a graph of cobbling moth emigration. So we released cobbling moth inside the cage plot and inside a control plot, and then we captured them outside of it. And on the y-axis is the average number of cobbling moth that we caught per trap. The x-axis is our treatments, which were a cage and a control. The left bar in red is what we got in 2018. The right bar in black is what we caught in 2019. So as you can see in 2018, we captured fewer cobbling moth outside the cage treatments than outside the control plots. Whereas in 2019, there was no difference with a significant reduction in the amount of cobbling moth we were captured in 2019. So what this shows is that cobbling moth released inside the cage can fly through the netting and be captured on traps outside of it, although a little bit less than if there was no netting at all. Whereas on this graph, 
is the codling moth immigration. So we release codling moth outside the cage or outside the control plots and try to recapture them within the plot. So same 2018, 2019, red, black, respectively. And the y-axis is still the average number of codling moth that we caught. X is our two treatments, cage and control. So this shows a much more striking difference. In the cage plots, we caught only one moth in 2018 and none in 2019, where we had a pretty good capture in the control plots. So this shows that the calling moth really did not move back into the plots through the netting as efficiently. So from the calling moth immigration immigration trials, we learned that the calling moth could move from inside a netted plot to outside of a netted plot, even though it was hindered a little bit, but really almost never moved back into the netted plot. So going back to our original experiments, we're still trying to determine if the moths that we caught were due to an internal reproducing population or just those few moths moving into the plot. And if it truly is a barrier from them moving in, can we use shade netting alone as a control strategy for a newly established plot that doesn't have any codling moth in it? So to test this, we move back to our large cage trials and we want to test our two treatments, a cage, which was just netting and no other treatment compared to a control where there was no treatment and their effects on codling moth density. Now these large cage plots already had an established population of codling moth in them from years of being an experimental orchard without being under conventional management. So we spent the majority of 2018 sanitizing these cages through measures such as putting up the netting well before bloom and keeping it up just before snowfall. We also put cardboard bands around the trunks of trees to catch any calling moth pupae and larvae and prevent them from completing generations. And we removed all the fruit in the middle of June to prevent the second and third generation from being complete as well. We also tracked the adult abundance throughout the year using a delta trap that was baited with the calling moth pheromone and tracking these larvae and pupae numbers throughout the year to see if our efforts were working. Here are our results from 2018 to see if the sanitation was actually effective. On the y-axis, we have the average number of codling moth adults that we captured. And on the x-axis is our two treatments of cage and control. In this case, the left bar in red represents the capture that we had before we removed the apples. And then the black bar on the right is how many we captured after removal of apples. And we removed apples in both the cage and uncaged treatments to keep it equal and comparable. So here we can see in the cage, before we removed apples, we were catching quite a bit of a total codling moth. However, after there was a significant reduction, and this is the accumulation of both the second and third generation, whereas this is just the first generation. So we have a significant drop off in adult capture, whereas in the control, it's only a slight drop off in capture when we removed all those fruit, likely because moths were moving in from other plots nearby. Here are results from the calling moth cardboard bands around the trunks of trees. So looking at the number of larvae that we caught per plot. The y-axis is the average number of larvae. The x-axis is our three generations, first, second, and third. And the second and third were after apple removal, whereas the first was before. The bar on the left in red is the number that we caught in the cage. The bar on the right in black is the number that we caught in the check. So before apple removal, you can see we were catching quite a few codling moth larvae per band in both the cage and the check. But immediately after that removal, like we would expect, getting rid of the host, the second and third generation almost didn't exist. So what we can summarize from this is that based on the adult calling moth capture and the larvae capture, these plots had been sanitized and the calling moth population within them became almost non-existent. Now that we have the sanitized plots from 2018, in 2019, we kept the same treatments and wanted to see if the netting by itself could provide effective control for a codling moth by preventing reestablishment. So to test this, we put a codling moth pheromone trap in each plot, and we also did a pre-harvest damage evaluation. Here are the results for the adult codling moth capture. On the y-axis, we have the average codling moth per plot, and the x-axis is our dates. The black bar on top is the capture in the control plots and the red bar on bottom is the capture in the cage plots. So as you can see, as we enter the first generation of codling moth, the capture in the control was about nine times as high as the capture in the cage, showing that the netting was a barrier, but not a perfect barrier to immigrating codling moth. As we continue to look at the rest of the season, we can see that by the second and third generation, the differences between the treatments disappeared. 
And from this, what we're gaining is that these few codling moths that entered the cage plot in the first generation were able to reproduce as effectively as all of these codling moths that entered the control plot and basically caught the populations up to each other to mirror each other throughout the rest of the season. We found very similar results with the codling moth damage in the plots. So here on this graph, the y-axis is the average percent fruit damage per plot, and the x-axis is our two treatments, cage and control. This graph represents just the first generation codling moth damage. So these counts were taken around the middle of June, just after the first peak in adult abundance. And here we can see there was about three times as much damage in the control as in the cage plots, which makes sense since there was about nine times as many adults in the control plots as we found in the cage plots. However, as the season progressed and the differences in adult abundance disappeared, so did the differences in percent codling moth damage. So here on this graph is showing the pre-harvest codling moth damage, so after all three generations were complete. And as you can see, there was no longer a difference between the cage and control treatments. There was actually a little bit more damage in the cage plots. So from this experiment, we learned that netting can serve as a barrier to external codling moth, as shown by the drastic reduction in the first generation. But we also learned that if just a few codling moth get into an untreated plot, they are able to fully colonize it by the second and third generation. So netting would be an effective tool in combination with other techniques for codling moth management. The research shown to this point had only been done on a WSU experimental research plot of about half an acre. And we wanted to know if the same results that netting could inhibit codling moth immigration would occur at a commercial scale. Fortunately, we had a nearby orchard collaborator who offered to let us use some of their netted plots to test this same idea. This time we incorporated three treatments. We had the full net enclosure, it's pictured here in the upper right. We also added a block that had just overhead netting to see if netting of any kind could deter coughing moth emigration. And then we compared it to a check where there was no netting at all. We replicated it over time by releasing coughing moth every week outside the plot and capturing within the plot every week. As you can see, we released for July, August, and September. Here's an overview of our trapping and release setup. As you can see within the plot, whether it was netted completely in overhead netting or a control with no netting, we had the trap set up around the perimeter and one at the center. And then we had release points in the bordering orchard all around it as well to see if the moths would fly from outside the orchard and be trapped inside the orchard. Here are the results from those experiments. The 2019 results are in the upper left. On the y-axis, we have the percent recovered sterile moths that we released, and the x-axis is our three treatments. As you can see, the full cage had the lowest capture of recovered moths, while the overhead had slightly less than the check. This shows that netting of any kind has some effect, but the full cage has the most effect on reducing the number of immigrating moths. In 2020, we only had two treatments. So we were unable to include the overhead netting. We have the same axes of number of recovered moths in our treatments. And here you can see the cage did have a significant reduction in number of recovered moths. And what this shows is that even at a commercial scale, full netting does inhibit moth immigration, but not completely to zero. From these five years of research, we've learned a lot about netting and codling moth control. We've shown that full enclosures can prevent a significant portion of moths moving in from neighboring blocks. And when combined with conventional management, netting significantly enhanced codling moth control. However, if a few moths are able to get into an untreated plot, they are able to establish large populations quickly, even under netting. And netting has the potential to exclude natural enemies like lacewings and surfids, which can lead to secondary pest outbreaks. While we've been looking at netting for codling moth control in Washington since 2015, researchers in Europe have been doing it for about a decade longer. It began in apples in 2005 when growers decided to modify their hail net structures to be enclosures to help with codling moth management since they were applying over 12 insecticides a year and still getting high levels of damage. They then adapted this in pair in 2008 and they decided to test two different structures. One was the row cover shown here and then a full block enclosure here. These studies were conducted in France and Italy, and they found very similar results to what we found. These charts show percent fruit damage by coughing moth and oriental fruit moth. And here on the left is France apple studies, 
in 2011 and 2012, and the right is studies in Italy on pairs. The light blue bars show the damage in unnetted plots, and then the left bars are unnetted. And as you can see in both apple and pear, the percent fruit damage was dramatically reduced for those pests. They did note that the full whole orchard enclosures like we use here in Washington were less effective than the row covers that they used. They also did not have outbreaks of other pests and diseases, except for a couple cases in France where both rosy and woolly apple leaf is required in additional insecticide control in some areas. Now these results are 10 years old, but they are almost identical to what we are finding, and hopefully we'll get an update from them soon about more recent results. With that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped with this project. My advisor at the time, Dr. Betsy Beers, and her lab crew for helping build these structures and do all of the sampling. I would also like to thank the funding sources that provided the supplies and help for this research to be conducted. Here are my references throughout the talk.